terrorizing a city, taunting police. Sound familiar? It's happened before. This is the Zodiac speaking. I like killing people because it is so much fun. His intent was to dominate and terrorize, not just to murder. Zodiac, an elusive killer from another time. But unlike the D.C. area sniper, Zodiac looked his victims in the eye, even snipped a souvenir from one victim's shirt. All the while, this victim is dying. Yes. Cold. Beyond cold. Tonight, a promising breakthrough in the case. He left an ominous trail of letters and cryptic puzzles, signed with a chilling trademark, a name tied to the occult. I would then try to recover DNA from the cells that may have been deposited on the letter. Explosive new DNA evidence uncovered during Primetime's year-long investigation. Reported here for the first time. You're looking at the genetic identity of Zodiac. What does that feel like? One of the most notorious unsolved crimes ever. John Quinones with irrefutable new proof in the hunt for the Zodiac Killer. From ABC News, this is Primetime Thursday with Diane Sawyer and Charles Gibson. Tonight, the Zodiac Killer, a primetime investigation. Good evening and welcome. Charlie Gibson's away tonight. Glad to have John Quinones with us. Good to be here, Diane, and welcome to another edition of Primetime Thursday. Well, tonight we bring you a major investigation that at first may sound familiar. A whole region terrified. Random killings. A man who leaves a calling card tied to the occult. But no, this is not the Washington, D.C. area sniper. It's one of the most famous unsolved cases in American crime. And John's here to tell us about it. Diane, he called himself Zodiac. And he left behind a trail of bodies and taunting letters. Then suddenly the murder stopped and he went silent. For the past year, Primetime has been digging for clues. The case has been reopened. Cutting-edge science is being used to find the true identity of the killer. And now there's critical new evidence, which we'll tell you about tonight. But first, we take you back to the beginning of Zodiac's reign of terror. Zodiac, a symbol that now stands for terror, has killed five and says he's going to kill again. Psychopath who kills for the thrill of publicity. The first killings and the enduring mystery begin not far from San Francisco. It is late one night, five days before Christmas, 1968. Nothing appears to stand between Apollo 8 and the moon. Two young lovers, David Faraday and Mary Lou Jensen, are parked beside a country road near the town of Vallejo when headlights appear out of the darkness. The car stops behind them. A man gets out and fires a 22 caliber weapon. Philip uh, entered the, where the sign is here and crashed through into the inside of the car. The shooter circles the car, blows out a rear tire, then confronts the terrified teenage lovers. The two victims were ordered out of the car and shot out of the car. A double murder on Lover's Lane. Shocking, especially for a peaceful town like Vallejo. Frightening because it's such a random act. And frustrating because the hunt for the killer turns up nothing. And then, just six months later, it happens again. Two miles from here, at another lover's lane. It's after midnight, July 5th, 1969. 22-year-old Darlene Farron and 19-year-old Mike Majot believe the man approaching their car is a policeman until he opens fire. Darlene dies at the wheel of her car. Mike barely survives. No one knows this is the start of a random killing spree until the killer begins writing a terrifying series of letters to newspapers. He calls himself Zodiac. His signature, a symbol of crosshairs in a gun sight. This is the Zodiac speaking. I like killing people because it is so much fun. The police shall never catch me. He brags of his killings, he taunts police, hey, hey. and he terrifies Northern California. Dear editor, this is the murderer of the two teenagers last Christmas and the girl on the 4th of July. To prove I killed them, I shall state some facts which only I and the police know. He reveals the exact number of shots fired, 
the precise positions of the bodies. Even the brands of ammunition used in the attacks are listed in the letters. First of all, they're scary as hell. The San Francisco Chronicle's Robert Graysmith says the Zodiac's letters are full of frighteningly accurate details. Doing such things as describing what the, uh, the woman was wearing, uh, you know, enough details to tell the police that, the, that he was the man. The headlines focus on terror. The public is transfixed by the menacing threat of random murder. Yet for three decades, the Zodiac, a brazen serial killer who was so careful about leaving a trail, remains at large. But today, thanks to new crime scene technology, there's reason to believe that time may have run out on Zodiac. Somewhere, perhaps on the back of this postage stamp, or in the seal of this envelope, may be microscopic clues that will now finally lead police to the killer. We're hoping to be able to get some genetic information about the individual or individuals that did seal these envelopes or place stamps on them. In the San Francisco Police Department's state-of-the-art DNA lab, Dr. Sidney Holt is taking up the hunt for Zodiac. Careful as he was, it's unlikely that 33 years ago, Zodiac would worry about leaving behind a genetic trail, or that a kindergartner at the time, little Sidney Holt, would grow up to become a police scientist and come looking for him. If there are cells on those envelopes, we will get the DNA from them and, and get an answer. This is the dawning of the it's the late 60s, the age of Aquarius. When Zodiac appears, San Francisco is the center of a new era of peace and love. Jim Dunbar, a radio and TV personality at the time. This was a wonderful place to, to be. And suddenly it stopped. This guy stopped it. Stopped it with the murders of those teenage lovers near the town of Vallejo and with his taunting letters. The Zodiac writes that the secret to his deadly accuracy here at the first murder scene is a little flashlight that he tapes to the barrel of his gun so that he can zero in on his victims in total darkness. He shoots David Faraday as he tries to escape through that door. Betty Lou Jensen is hit with the light beam and the bullets as she runs toward the road. While taking credit, Zodiac includes something else in his letters, a cryptic puzzle called a cipher. If you can solve the puzzle, he promises, you will learn his real identity. Plus, he demands that newspapers publish it on their front pages or else. If you do not print this cipher, I will cruise around all weekend killing lonely people in the night until I end up with a dozen. And what did that do to this community? It terrified everyone. Three newspapers gave their front pages to this man. I mean, that's how terrified they were. At first, nobody solves the puzzle. So in his next letter, Zodiac teases. By the way, are the police having a good time with the code? If not, tell them to cheer up. When they do crack it, they will have me. By today's standards, Zodiac was quite a media genius. Mike Kelleher is a leading expert on criminal behavior and authority on the psychology of extreme violence, including serial killers. In fact, Kelleher recently wrote the first comprehensive psychological profile of Zodiac. In it, he analyzes each of the Zodiac letters and constructs a portrait of a constantly evolving serial killer. I think the kind of mind it takes is both brilliant and exceptionally sick, evil. Uh, sociopathic. Based simply on the fact that Zodiac's manipulation of the media was nothing short of brilliant. When the cipher is finally decoded, it sends another chill through the Bay Area. Zodiac's message? He's killing for sport. I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. But Zodiac is also a liar does not reveal his identity. I will not give you my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves. Over the next two years, Zodiac writes more than a dozen letters and cards to newspapers. He claims an increasing body count. He includes more cryptic ciphers. This one comes with a greeting card. This is the Zodiac speaking. I thought you would need a good laugh before you hear the bad news. P.S. Could you print this new cipher? on your front page. It's a mystery that seems to have a lot of people's curiosity peaked, and I get asked about it 
with some frequency. After all, the identity of Zodiac is one of the most enduring, unsolved mysteries. And that's why Dr. Sidney Holt is now on the case. She begins with the remaining envelopes Zodiac mailed. More than half disappeared over the decades. First, she removes the stamps and flaps. I would then try to recover DNA from the cells that may have been deposited on the letter when someone had licked it. She uses a centrifuge to separate the cells from the sticky adhesive. The science is so sound and reproducible that if the material is on the envelope, we will detect it. She uses the newest DNA detection technique called polymerase chain reaction, PCR for short. To produce a genetic profile, it needs just 50 human cells. We can start with a very, very small amount of material like you would have on the Zodiac letters and um, actually make more copies of the DNA, like a little Xerox machine, and amplify the areas of the DNA that are different between different individuals. This is what she's looking for, a pattern of spikes that indicates the presence of DNA. But results from two of the first three envelopes are negative. I can't detect any DNA. The test produces only flat lines. Disappointing. Certainly not the end. Not the end, because there's still work to do on that third envelope, the one Zodiac used for his menacing greeting card. Back when he mailed it in the summer of 1969, Zodiac probably wasn't worried about getting caught with future science. According to Mike Kelleher's profile, back then Zodiac was moving too fast. He evolved very quickly for a serial killer and in very dangerous ways. In fact, Zodiac is now nearing the peak of his bloody frenzy. He was ready to do murder and mayhem. He was ready to do it in daylight. He didn't care who saw him do it. Which is apparently why he comes to this tiny sliver of land. For Zodiac, this would become center stage for something even more strange and macabre. His first performance in full costume. Zodiac sets out to prove he can kill anytime, anywhere. I believe he came here to San Francisco to commit a deliberate murder so that he might garner that attention that had remained so elusive. And a chance to end the horror slips away. I do feel I second guess myself that night. When Prime Time returns. In the summer of 1969, the Zodiac Killer had murdered three young people and mortally wounded another in two separate attacks on couples parked in lovers' lanes. As we pick up our primetime investigation, Zodiac is poised to kill again. But this time, he's looking for a way to get even more attention. In a perplexing twist, the Zodiac Killer draws inspiration from a strange place. The Mikado, a Gilbert and Sullivan comic opera. In his letters, Zodiac assumes the role of the Mikado's Lord High Executioner. As someday it may happen that a victim must be found. As someday it may happen that a victim must be found. I've got a little list. I've got a little list of society's offenders who might well be underground would never be missed. It was probably something he enjoyed in his youth or was passed on to him. And it had tremendous symbolism. September 27th, 1969. For his new role of executioner, Zodiac chooses a peaceful setting in the heart of California's wine country. His fantasy-driven motivations were at their extreme. He was feeling very confident at that point, And his intent was to dominate and terrorize, not just to murder. Zodiac's victims, 22-year-old Cecilia Shepard and 20-year-old Brian Hartnell. It's late afternoon, the end of a warm, sultry day in the Napa Valley. Brian and Cecilia are sitting on a picnic blanket, overlooking the awesome beauty of Lake Berryessa. The setting is serene, tranquil, romantic, perfect for a young couple in love. But then suddenly, Cecilia notices they're not alone. Just steps away, she spots a figure behind a tree. The tranquility is about to turn to terror. 
Napa Sheriff's Captain Ken Narlow, retired 14 years, is still haunted by his memories of that awful day. There's no way you can imagine what went through their minds. There's no way you can put yourself in their position. It was a bone-chilling sight. The stranger lunging toward them with a pistol in his right hand, a foot-long knife strapped to his hip, and coils of plastic clothesline stuffed inside his jacket. He was dressed from head to toe in black, black gloves, black military shoes. And he was wearing a black hood like this one, with the eye holes cut out. On his chest, the symbol that would become his deadly trademark, the mark of the Zodiac. He said, you know I'm going to have to kill you. And of course, that's when he attacked them and stabbed them. The Zodiac was not yet done. While his two young victims lay moaning, bleeding from the massive stab wounds, police say he walked over to Brian's sports car, a Carmen Ghia like this one, and scrawled a chilling message on the passenger side door. It was like an artist signing his work. Using a felt marker, he writes the dates of all three of his attacks, the method of his latest crime, and his ominous trademark. It was essentially snubbing his nose at law enforcement and basically telling others that, hey, I've been here, I can do what I want, I can do it as often as I want, and there's nothing you can do about it. Brian, as I recall, was stabbed five times in the back, and Cecilia was stabbed approximately five times in the front and in the back, a total of ten times. Cecilia Shepard dies of her wounds. Brian Hartnell, though gravely wounded, survives. Before this attack, the Zodiac strikes only in rural, out-of-the-way places. But the prospect of an even larger stage may have inspired Zodiac's next move into the heart of San Francisco. Homicide Inspector Kelly Carroll. I believe he came here to San Francisco to commit a deliberate murder so that he might garner that attention that had remained so elusive. And with the murder of Paul Stein, he gained that notoriety. 10.30 p.m., October 11th, 1969. 29-year-old yellow cab driver Paul Stein takes a passenger from downtown to an exclusive neighborhood called Presidio Heights. The cab stops here at the corner of Washington and Cherry. Probably as Mr. Stein turned to collect his fare, the Zodiac shot him in the right side of his head. One shot. One shot. For the Zodiac, this is a real departure from his previous assaults. Before this, he ambushes only young couples on remote lover's lanes in the suburbs. This time, he kills a lone cab driver in a wealthy neighborhood in the big city, trying to prove, it seems, that he can kill anyone, anywhere. As if to underscore that point, he does something extraordinary here, even for the Zodiac. He had planned this and taken deliberate time to not only kill Mr. Stein, but then to tear away at his shirt and carry it away with him from the scene. All the while, this victim is dying. Yes. Cold. Beyond cold. Beyond cold. Inspector Carroll inherited Paul Stein's murder as a cold case two years ago, but he still feels a chill as he examines the cab driver's bloody shirt. Well, as you can see, the shirt is bloodstained. Um, and what appears happened is that the backside, what would be the tail of this shirt, has been cut out. Incredibly, the Zodiac lingers here at the murder scene for quite a while, collecting his trophies, the cab driver's wallet, his ID. He then calmly walks up Cherry Street. Little does he know that just around the corner, a police squad car is approaching. What did you see when you came down this road? My headlights went on to an individual who was walking in the shadow of the trees at the time. It may be the closest Zodiac ever comes to getting caught. Officer Don Falk has just heard a description of the killer over his radio. But the suspect is mistakenly described as African-American. When the, the headlights hit him, I took a look at him. And it was a white male and continued on. Moments later, Falk's radio corrects the description. But by then, the suspect has disappeared. At this point, police are investigating a routine murder and possibly a robbery by an unknown assailant. They have no idea that this is a Zodiac killing. But three days later, another letter. This is the Zodiac speaking. 
I am the murderer of the taxi driver. To prove this, here is a bloodstained piece of his shirt. The first one was received October 14, 1969. It was sent to the San Francisco Chronicle. Over the next several weeks, Zodiac sends two more swatches of the bloody shirt, along with letters taunting the police for failing to catch him. And he confirms that he was spotted that night by Officer Fount. I do feel I second-guessed myself that night. That you should have stopped him? Should have stopped and talked to him. But we didn't. Hey, pig, doesn't it rile you up to have your nose rubbed in your boo-boos? I can only imagine the frustration on the part of the detectives at the time. It would be uh, almost unbearable in terms of um, not only the professional but personal challenge that's laid out uh, to catch this man. The police shall never catch me because I have been too clever for them. He didn't say catch me if you can. He said you can't. And then, in a new letter, Zodiac's taunting turns into an unthinkable new threat. School children make nice targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning, just shoot out the front tire, and then pick off the kiddies as they come bouncing out. The San Francisco Bay Area goes on high alert. Hundreds of mothers are driving their children to school now rather than trust the bus. Suddenly, uh, everyone in town wants this thing solved, and they want it solved yesterday. The killer leaves clues, but it will take police decades to decipher them. Stunning new scientific evidence when primetime returns. John Quinones continues now with our primetime investigation into the Zodiac murders. By now, Zodiac has killed five people, and fear is pulsing through every neighborhood. No one knows when or where he'll strike next. With his credentials established in blood and his letters and cryptic ciphers making headlines, Zodiac is no longer just a serial killer. He's now a domestic terrorist who seems to need attention as much as he needs to kill. I get awfully lonely when I am ignored. So lonely, I could do my thing. He threatens to build a bomb and blow up a bus full of children. The death machine is already made. I would have sent you pictures, but you would be nasty enough to trace them back to the developer and then to me. So I shall describe my masterpiece for you. Zodiac offers his recipe for a bomb, including diagrams, schematics, even maps with cryptic hints about where he plans to ambush the school bus. The nice part is that all the parts can be bought on the open market with no questions asked. A new threat leaves families with school children in fear. Many parents start driving their kids. Police cruisers escort school buses. Suddenly, um, everyone in town wants this thing solved, and they want it solved yesterday. It was a pretty ghastly awareness that suddenly gripped the, the community. And Jim Dunbar, host of a morning TV talk show, soon finds himself at the center of it all. Police tell him a man identifying himself as Zodiac wants to surrender on his show. Sure enough, the man calls in. Just tell us what's going on in, in, inside you right now, please. I have headaches. There was one moment when he talked about killing kids that I still remember with a shiver. I want to kill those kids. He calls back 11 times and eventually agrees to surrender to Dunbar at this thrift store. But he never shows up. So the cops were taking this phone call seriously. Yeah, they were satisfied that this could be the guy. Maps, diagrams, and threats aside, Zodiac never does attack a school bus. But his letters keep coming. And it seems everyone in San Francisco is looking for a crazed madman. And yet, Mike Kelleher's profile of Zodiac is a man who no one would suspect. He would be maybe a little gruff, uh, maybe wouldn't socialize a lot, uh, but wouldn't stand out in the crowd. And I think he was probably working and working a regular job during most of that period. But back in 1969, profiling a serial killer is still a thing of the distant future. In fact, police at the time are stymied. 
A composite sketch of the killer, released shortly after the cab driver murder, describes Zodiac as 35 to 45 years old, of stocky build, and wearing thick-rimmed glasses. His hair, possibly reddish-brown. And now, decades later, Dr. Sidney Holt finds what appears to be a reddish-brown hair stuck behind a stamp peeled from this letter. Could this tiny strand bear Zodiac's DNA fingerprint? She examines it, but again, no luck. The hair didn't have any recognizable root structure that would have the kind of DNA that we analyze in the crime lab. But disappointment is followed quickly by a possible breakthrough. Remember that taunting greeting card? Dr. Holt gets a tentative result from the outside of the envelope that contained it. I can tell you that there is an indication that there may be DNA uh, from one of the stamps. You could well be on the trail of the Zodiac. Well, it's, the prospect of being able to contribute to the story is exciting. Then, out of the blue, more good news for Dr. Holt. Our primetime investigation of the case leads to a major discovery. Three more Zodiac envelopes in mint condition. They quietly arrive at the lab after our inquiries with a retired police source. He had kept them in his personal files. Now you have a lot more to work with. It's got to be exciting. Well, the potential is exciting. The potential is higher now that we have um, three more envelopes, several more stamps. Exciting because Homicide Inspector Kelly Carroll and his partner Mike Maloney can then compare it with DNA samples from anyone suggested as a possible suspect, something the original Zodiac investigators could only have dreamed of. Might have seemed like Buck Rogers' science fiction to them, but if the Zodiac is solved, it'll be solved by the use of technology and science. More than 30 years later, nagging suspicions that can't be put to rest. I need to know if my father, the guy who held me when I was a baby, was a serial killer. He'll get his answer tonight on Prime Time. Stay with us. Prime Time investigation continues. Once again, John Quinones. After three decades, the Zodiac's painstaking care to avoid detection may be over. DNA lab results may finally provide a genetic trail back to the killer. This is the Zodiac speaking. Like I have always said, I am crack proof. If the blue meanies are ever going to catch me, they better get off their fat asses and do something. In a corner of the San Francisco Police Homicide Office, the Zodiac murder case occupies an entire file cabinet. Inside, records on scores, if not hundreds, of possible suspects, but not enough evidence to make an arrest. Zodiac has fooled investigators for 33 years now, and yet... We still get calls almost daily from people who believe they know who the Zodiac is. Websites and discussion groups abound, fueled by retired investigators, amateur sleuths, and armchair experts. This case is a lightning rod in many ways for people's fascination with the horrors of crime. Earlier this year, in fact, fans of the Zodiac mystery formed an amateur investigator's task force. They gather near Vallejo, one of the murder scenes. But nobody here or anywhere has been chasing Zodiac longer than former newspaper man Robert Graysmith. And there are a lot of strange uh, theories and things but if it's one man, if it's one man only. His suspect is a former San Francisco Bay Area resident, a school teacher named Arthur Lee Allen. Graysmith has painstakingly compiled a mountain of circumstantial evidence over the years, including witnesses who place Allen at or near every Zodiac murder scene. Victim Darlene Farron's complaint of a stalker who, like Allen, called himself Lee. Allen's watch, brand named Zodiac, with a logo identical to the one used by the killer. And there are footprint impressions taken at the site of the Lake Berryessa shootings and traced to a rare military shoe. There were a limited number of them. Uh, our suspect wears them. It's not just that. He's a size 10 and a half. The shoes that were pressed into the dry sand of Lake Berryessa, size 10 and a half. Alan doesn't resemble the composite sketch, but even that could be explained in a Zodiac letter. I look like the description passed out, only when I do my thing. The rest of the time, 
I look entirely different. And in this police report, one year before the Zodiac murders, Alan reportedly tells a friend that he plans to kill couples at lover's lanes, attach a flashlight to his gun and shoot people in the dark, write letters to harass police, and that he plans to call himself Zodiac. To know about Zodiac before there was a Zodiac, to use the symbol, to wear that watch, and, uh, and to be at the crime scenes and to know the victims, he would have to be Zodiac. But Graysmith also lacks any physical evidence. And nine years ago, Arthur Lee Allen died without ever being named a suspect by police. However, if Dr. Sidney Holt can find enough genetic material from Zodiac stamps and letters, she can compare it to a wafer-thin slice of brain tissue from Arthur Lee Allen's autopsy. This brain tissue from Arthur Lee Allen is the, the reference sample that I would use for the comparison. Dr. Holt has already detected the possible presence of Zodiac's DNA in the seal of the envelope that contained the greeting card. And just in case that test fails to produce a full DNA profile, she also prepares to look for DNA beneath the stamps on two of these three letters. Depending on whether those DNAs match each other, um, might allow me to include or exclude Arthur Lee Allen as potentially contributing the DNA on the Zodiac letters. Mike Rodell another passionate amateur investigator. He is certain that Arthur Lee Allen is not the Zodiac killer. Instead, Rodelli believes Zodiac is not only still alive, but that he's one of San Francisco's most wealthy and prominent citizens. He's a very high-powered businessman and probably the last person you would ever expect to be a serial killer. From his home in New Jersey, Rodelli pursues his theory. Since Zodiac was a prolific letter writer, he reasons, maybe he wrote to newspapers before naming himself Zodiac. So Rodelli sifts through old letters to the editor and surprisingly finds a peculiar one in a California newspaper exactly six months after the first murders. It mentioned uh, the specter of, of young people lying dead and wounded in the street and that had already happened at Lake Herman Road in December of 68. Uh, the letter writer signs using his real name. Rodelli tracks him down. As it turns out, at the time of the cab driver's murder, Rodelli's suspect lived within a couple of blocks of the crime scene. You know, if you have a suspect who's living in a house overlooking the crime scene or the search area, then this person can both view the search and also be totally uh, immune from being captured because he's watching from the, the, the comfort of his own living room, basically. In his letters, Zodiac taunts police while admitting that he did remain near the murder scene, watching the police search from the safety of a hiding place. I enjoy needling the blue pigs. Hey, blue pig, the dogs never came within two blocks of me, and they were to the west. The motorcycles went by about 150 feet away. We ask Officer Don Falk to take us back to the place where he spotted the man he later realized was Zodiac. He came down the north side of the street and turned and went up a flight of stairs into a courtyard. He brings us very close to the house, then occupied by the man Mike Rodelli suspects. How do you feel to have brought us almost right to the doorstep of an individual that has been singled out? Well, I... I feel a little bit uh, miffed about it that this individual wasn't pointed out by somebody before now. I feel pretty sure that I've discovered the Zodiac Killer. Am I, am I certain? Can I ever be 100% certain? No. Well, maybe he can be. We call Rodelli's suspect at his office. He says it's, quote, insane to suspect that he is Zodiac. And he agrees to give us a sample of his DNA to compare. It sounds so strange, the idea that one of San Francisco's prominent citizens could also be the city's most notorious serial killer. But then, consider the story of this graduate journalism student in New York. My father, Charles Clifton Collins, may be the Zodiac killer. William Collins first had that chilling thought when he picked up a book on the Zodiac killer a few years ago. And I, I popped it open, and the very first thing my eyes hit in that book was a postcard with that strange scrawl on it. I just got the creeps, and I thought, oh my God, that's my dad's handwriting. 
As Collins reads the book, he finds many more coincidences. His father looks like the composite sketch. He wore military-style shoes, size 10 and a half, just like Zodiac. He lived in San Francisco only during the time of the killings. Collins even finds his father's initials, CCC, on this card sent by Zodiac to Gold Police. But he keeps coming back to the handwriting and finds some very odd similarities. My dad wrote a letter um, where he wrote um, the word who, H-O-O, and the Zodiac wrote a letter where he said it won't do, D-O-O. -O. Um, very strange similarities like that. Charles Clifton Collins died in 1993, but his son wants to know the truth about his suspicions. So he gives us an old letter sealed by his father and a sample of his own DNA for verification. Now he waits in dread while Dr. Sidney Holt at the San Francisco Police Lab tries to isolate Zodiac's DNA. So I need to know if Charles Clifton Collins, my father, the guy who held me when I was a baby, um, I need to know if he was a serial killer. I have to know. I have to know. I just have to know. The moment of truth, three decades in the making. The DNA tests come back from the lab. You get an adrenaline rush knowing that part of this puzzle has been revealed to you. A major breakthrough in the hunt for the Zodiac when primetime returns will finally know whether he left a telltale clue behind. Will the Zodiac Killer finally be revealed? This is the San Francisco Police Department's DNA lab six days ago, exactly 33 years to the day after Zodiac murdered taxi driver Paul Stein. Dr. Sidney Holt is about to answer the question, did the Zodiac Killer leave a genetic trail that could lead to his capture? The answer is yes. I found a partial DNA fingerprint from a male individual who at some time has had contact with the stamp. You're looking at the Zodiac Killer's genetic identity, the peaks on this graph. It excites the senses. Homicide Inspector Kelly Carroll. You get an adrenaline rush knowing that part of this puzzle has been revealed to you. What Dr. Holt finds is four out of a possible nine DNA markers plus an indicator of gender. XY means male. Not enough to positively identify anyone as Zodiac, but it's enough to narrow suspicions or perhaps even eliminate suspects. Next, Dr. Holt compares the partial profile from the Zodiac letter, the pattern of peaks on that bottom row, to a DNA sample from Bay Area school teacher Arthur Lee Allen along the top there. You can see the they're distinctly the different. Well, based on the, the information that I developed, um, the Arthur Lee Allen could not have contributed the DNA that I detected on the stamp. Arthur Lee Allen, the focus of 30 years of research and a mountain of circumstantial evidence exonerated by science. And what about that prominent San Francisco businessman linked by the research of amateur investigator Mike Rodelli? We give Dr. Holt the businessman's DNA profile. Could you tell us whether or not he might have been a suspect? Huh. You know, I've looked at this Zodiac data so much, um, I can tell you just by looking at this result that this person is, is not a match with the evidence sample. But what about this man, Charles Clifton Collins? He looks just like the composite sketch, and his handwriting convinced his own son, William, that he and Zodiac are one and the same. When we present the Collins DNA profile to Dr. Holt, she stops the interview. This needs a closer look. Can I have a minute to go look at some different sure. data at my desk? She leaves for a more detailed comparison. A few minutes later, she's back. Okay, you've had a chance to review it. What can you tell us? And it's another sample that doesn't match with the evidence. The comparison was made, and it's very clear that your father was not... Uh, not the guy, huh? ...the man. This is a good day in my life. <laughs> very good day. I am very, very, very relieved.
Zodiac's partial DNA profile has already eliminated possible suspects. It's now an invaluable investigative tool. But is there more evidence out there? After all, in his letters, Zodiac claimed many more victims than the five police attributed to him. Inspector Carroll keeps coming back to the murdered cab driver's bloody shirt. Zodiac cut off a large piece of it, but mailed only three small swatches to newspapers. Where is the rest of it? Do I think it's still out there? I want to believe it's still out there. And actually, I do think it's still out there. Perhaps in a drawer among the keepsakes of an old man. Perhaps this video of the cab driver's shirt or the image of Zodiac's frightening costume. Might any of this spark something in someone's memory or revive someone's conscience? Do you think the Zodiac is still alive? Maybe even watching this tonight? Certainly the possibility exists that Zodiac is still alive. He would be probably in his 60s. I know that if he is, he's got to be a little more uncomfortable about the fact that um, the police have taken one step forward, one step closer to catching him. And I hope he's worried if he is watching. Perhaps Zodiac could also be dead. The possibility of suicide was raised by the killer himself in his last confirmed letter, dated 1974. He signs off with a disturbing lyric from his favorite comic opera, The Mikado. He plunged himself into the billowy wave and an echo arose from the suicide's grave. Was he about to kill himself or only his identity as Zodiac? The answer, for now at least, still remains a mystery. The San Francisco Police Department has set up a special email address for people to send leads and tips. You'll find that address and more on the Zodiac murders at abcnews.com. We'll be right back. Night. I'll see you tomorrow morning on Good Morning America. I'm Diane Sawyer. Good night. And I'm John Quinones. From all of us here at Primetime Thursday, have a great night. This has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC.